In this video, I'm going to show you how to change the thermostat in a 2014 Mazda 6. It is similar for the CX-5, any of the vehicles that have the 2.5 uh, four-cylinder engine in it. The thermostat housing is located literally where the red dot is, and right inside of it, right there, is where the thermostat lives. So in order to gain access to this area, we will have to uh, remove quite a few things. We will have to remove the battery and the battery tray. And according to the instructions, we will also have to remove the PCM. When we're unhooking the battery, we're going to remove the negative terminal first so that there is no ground for the positive side. So therefore, we're going to remove the negative terminal first, and then we're going to go ahead and remove the positive side. Now that we've removed the battery, it is pretty obvious that we're going to have to remove the tray. And as you can see, this portion here is part of the tray. The airbox grommets are on top of this bracket. We're going to have to remove the airbox. We're going to have to unhook the PCM and then the bolts associated with it. Remove them out of the way. And that is how we're going to have access to the housing for the thermostat right behind that plastic container. So we're getting ready to go ahead and remove the air box. For that, you're going to have to remove the clip. Make sure you press really hard on this so that this front portion can lift up and can come off in that fashion. Then this wiring harness will be separated from the box. We basically go ahead and simply unhook the front we're gonna lift this up um, but before we lift this up we're also going to undo this uh, bolt right here so that we can actually just simply remove this whole unit outwards okay so we've removed the hose end and we've got the cover removed but <clears throat> I guess this is in here, so I'm just going to leave this on, just set this aside because I'm going to have a ton of room in here. Our air filter comes out, and as you can see, my air filter is somewhat dirty, so I do have another one in stock. Perhaps I may throw in a new one, uh, but I may blow this one out for in, the t in, the, in the meantime if I don't have one so that I can put a new filter inside. So inside is all clean, so we know that this is doing its job. So in order to get this unit pulled out, um, you can see this uh, intake returns into the bottom of the uh, housing. Uh, there's a way to disconnect it. However, what we're gonna do is, is we're simply going to open these bolts up here and we're gonna pull the whole unit up. And with that, the unit is out. The next thing here is to remove the top plate that covers the PCM connectors. So just like that, it will unhook from the back like this. So we've got this removed. I have removed the three bolts that hold this tray down. Uh, everything here is one unit. So what we need to now do is, is disconnect the, this connector right here. And then there is a, a wiring harness that goes in and it connects into here. So for that, we're going to have to push this tab in and lift this cover up. With that, um, these are the two connectors that we need to disconnect. So to disconnect this connector right here, we're just going to push down, push forward, and that ends up causing us to be able to lift the connector out. We're going to push that out of the way. We are then going to work on disconnecting this connector. If you bring the connector forward, 
So there is this tab right here. So we're just going to go ahead and push that tab inwards, pull that up. You just needed to struggle a little bit more to get this one out. So this one has released itself. So we're are going to so we're going to move this harness out of the way. We're going to move this harness out of the way into here. And we should now be able to lift this complete unit upwards and out. And that basically uncovers the thermostat housing. So you can kind of see it's kind of wet and it's all soily in there. That's all of that oil that has been leaking from the valve covers has reached here. So our next step is going to be to make sure we clean up all that oil residue before I even attempt to open up the housing here. In order to drain the coolant from the radiator, we're going to have to jack up the vehicle six inches. Because of the low prof profile of the vehicle, uh, the added height is needed to be able to slide in a drain pan and to be able to access the port uh, where we're going to be uh, removing, where we're going to use to remove the coolant from. Please note that your body at no time should be underneath the vehicle. If you are going to uh, put your head or your shoulders or whatever underneath the vehicle, then you need to jack up the car enough so that you are installing jack stands. And if you click in the link in the upper right hand corner, that video will show you how to jack up the vehicle and to locate and install the jack stands so that you can safely work underneath the vehicle. In order to drain the radiator, we're going to have to open up this viewport so that we can get to the drain plug on the bottom of the radiator. With the cover removed, I just want to show you what the valve looks like underneath. That's the drain plug for the radiator. The wing portion on the side, right hand side, is the valve. You basically unscrew it, so counterclockwise, till the fluid starts coming out. Once the fluid is done, we will then uh, close that valve back up. We now have the coolant coming out. We will wait for it to drain completely, then close the valve. In order to dispose of the coolant, we want to make sure we do not throw it under into the drains or into the storm drains. We want to make sure we take care of our environment and we take it to the dump so that the liquid can be disposed of properly. In the process of removing some of the coolant or as much of the coolant uh, as I can from the system. We've, for the most part, drained the block because we had the water pump removed. We drained the radiator from the bottom. The only thing that's left to do now is to drain this uh, water reservoir. For that, what you do is, is you have to unhook, you have to unhook this wiring harness on this side, unhook or unclip I mean the wiring harness from here once you've done that you are then able to pull the wire wiring harness out after that you want to remove the upper portion of the hose that goes to the radiator cap and then what you want to do is is want to pull upwards these tabs these the these tabs right here on the side go into slots and so we basically will just pull up on it just like that and then we do the same thing on the other side take a screwdriver and add that all right so now that's freed up the water bottle right here 
and we can now go ahead and dump this fluid out and replace it with fresh fluid. So just before we get started to removing the thermostat housing, as you can see, I have gone through and cleaned up a majority of the area. We still have some of that black area up on top, but we'll get to that after we close up everything. But pretty much all the rest of the dirt and grime has been cleaned off and uh, pretty much cleaned up the top as well. So we're gonna get some coolant that's going to come out of this once we uh, once we remove this. Um, so we want to make sure is is that you've got a uh, catch basin down underneath. The other thing is is in my case we may not get any coolant coming out because we did the water filter. I mean we did the water pump. So most of the fluid that was in here might have already come out. To gain access to the thermostat, we're going to remove the three eight millimeter bolts right here that are on the plastic uh, thermostat cover. So there we go. The thermostat is exposed. We only got a, a little bit of fluid coming out of this hose. This hose goes to the bottom of the radiator. So let's see if we get some fluid coming out of here. There we go, that's been removed. And as you can see, there wasn't much fluid. So here we have the old thermostat. This is a new thermostat. They pretty much look identical. Uh, there's no difference. Uh, the gasket still looks good on the old one. Uh, the part numbers are still the same between the two. And uh, so I've got about 115,000 miles on this. Um, everything seems to be intact but since I do have the whole system opened up so I'm going to go ahead and replace it uh, thing to note here is uh, pretty much all thermostats now come with this uh, fail safe basically um, if the thermostat stops working pressure builds up behind it rather than blowing some of the other components uh, what it does is it provides you know this pushes the pin outwards and causes fluid to come through, hence reducing the pressure behind the thermostat. So pretty much they all do. And if you use an aftermarket thermostat that does not have this, please make sure you drill a hole and, uh, and you don't need to have something covering it up. So that small hole isn't gonna be bleeding a lot of fluid. So it's best to have that fail safe built in. So if you get a water filter, uh, if you get a water thermostat, for your system that does not have that you can go ahead and put a small hole through the flange and everything should be good okay so we're installing the new thermostat and the new thermostat has a nib on it and as you can see there is a groove up on top so basically i think this ensures that the hole is at the highest most point in this housing so anyhow you want to make sure when you install it it gets installed so that the nib is in that groove Okay, so the thermostat is holding itself in place. We're going to go ahead and install the housing. You might have noticed that in this uh, case we did not have a uh, gasket between the the cover and the housing, the housing itself, and that's because the uh, the thermostat itself has a rubber gasket on it, so it creates the seal between the housing and the cover here. All right, so once we get these uh, bolts uh, tied in, we're going to go ahead and torque them. The torque requirements are anywhere from seventy-one to ninety-seven. Uh, inch inch pounds and so we're gonna I think aim for like 90 maybe and then uh, torque them in so while we have everything out uh, I'm thinking that we're gonna go ahead and clean this out with water as well 
So what we're going to do is, is we're going to remove these two screws so that we can get this sensor out. So we don't want to get this sensor to wipe up. The other thing that we're going to do is, is as you can see, uh, there is a bunch of dirt that you can see inside. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to remove this uh, as well. And we're going to uh, vacuum out whatever's in the throttle body right now. And then uh, I'm going to take throttle body, throttle body cleaner fluid and try to wipe down the inside. So I've reinstalled the uh, sensor on the uh, air box. Uh, this can only go in one direction. So if you were to turn it 180 degrees, it won't fit. So I'm going to get these screws in and then start to clean the, the throttle body. And as you can see, I guess I had 115,000 miles. Perhaps this is the first time this is getting done. All I did was use some of this carb choke throttle body cleaner, sprayed it on the towel and uh, just started cleaning the inside. This is just the bottom half and as you can see there's quite a bit more still left inside. So we're just going to, going to continue to do that and then um, that's basically it. So I just kind of wanted to show you that it's, it's a worthwhile activity to be done if you're going to have this whole area opened up and cleaning it. So might as well go the extra mile to clean up some of the stuff. So we've got the throttle body cleaned out as much as we can. So I, I captured the bottom, the upper portion, the inside of the, uh, the, the, the flap here, and then the outside of the flap. I do, however, want to show you what the inside looks like. Um, I'm not sure if the video is going to be able to capture this or not. You can see it's kind of shiny inside and that's because there is a lot of oil so basically uh, we'll talk more about this in a separate video uh, I may end up uh, adding an oil can basically uh, it'll remove the the uh, the oil from the air that's being recirculated back into the throttle body from the crankshaft from the crankcase Basically, pressure builds up in the in the crankcase. That pressure has to be relieved, and those. And so, what you ended up putting is is a um, PVC valve in in some of the older cars or whatever. Anyhow, some type of a format for it to breathe out when the pressure builds up, and then that air can't be let out into the environment. So it's put back right into the throttle body, and a lot of oil also ends up coming with that uh, blowback. Uh, and so what ends up happening is you end up getting oil in your throttle bodies and then into your you know intake valves and so and so forth so one of the ways to filter out that oil is to basically add an oil can in that line from the engine to the air uh, to the throttle body this way you basically end up filtering out the oil and then you just allow clean air to pass through so we will talk about that a little later. I'll do a mod on that and then uh, we'll go from there. But that is something that you should pretty much get added as soon as possible, as new as a car is, so that you can keep the throttle body as clean as possible. So we've got the, extent, the extension between the air intake and the throttle body on. It can only go on one way and then the thing to note here is there is a nib so if you were to pull this right there it sets in in that so we're just going to go ahead and tighten the screws here now we've got the air intake assembly we're just going to go ahead and drop it in Basically, this should marry up with the holes up here, and then here, it should simply drop in to the front into the pins that are sticking out from the base of this. So that's in. We've got another one of these grommets here, and then that's basically it. So now we're going to go ahead and install the two bolts up here and the air intake assembly is ready for the next part we have routed our wires properly we've got these uh, bolts done 
So we're going to go ahead and drop these connections in. So those are pushed in, they're secure. Our next thing would be to go and install the connector to the PCM. You want to make sure you get it down straight and then you pull on the lever which locks it in place. So this connection is made. So we've got the airbox cover in, we've got the electronic connection made here. The wire, uh, uh, the wire harness is plugged in here. We've got this pipe installed. We've got the two screws here tightened. So everything is in place. We've got this hose reattached. We got this uh, housing back on, unit on here. I had originally bent this plate out so I had to get that back bent back because it's got a connector that goes down so it's got to be in its right location. We've got the cover plate to the PCM connectors back on so that these cannot be tampered with. Uh, we're now left with uh, just simply installing the battery. Looking at our battery, uh, we definitely have a leak. We don't want to reinstall this without cleaning. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to vacuum up this garbage and then we're going to wipe this uh, the faces down and then clean up this connector right here because we don't want any of this stuff because this is just causing corrosion and that's basically it. These are supposed to be uh, non-serviceable batteries but what can we do? Um, I think we may have to go and get this thing turned in just because it's uh, leaking quite a bit. So we've got the battery in place, we've cleaned everything up, removed all of the oxidation that was there. The battery is still good. So what we're going to do is, is uh, later on I'll show you how to refill your battery with the correct fluid. That'll be for another video. But we did go ahead and make the uh, connectors. I do like to apply a dielectric tape, uh, uh, a paste on here. It helps with preventing corrosion uh, happening due to the moisture that's in the air. So apply a little bit of it, coat the terminal, and then make the connection. Likewise on this side. You can see some of that stuff on, sticking out from the top. So that helps prevent uh, corrosion from starting. So what we're going to also do is, is we're going to go ahead and coat the terminal itself as well so that no corrosion starts happening over there due to that moisture. We're going to be using the FL22 Genuine Mazda coolant. The reason we're going to do this is because uh, we do have some coolant that is still left in the system. Uh, we did remove the water pump, so we got most of the coolant out of the block. I'm pretty sure there are some uh, jackets in there that still have some coolant. Uh, we did drain out the coolant from the radiator, and it definitely emptied out the hoses. Um, so we've got most of the coolant out, but not all of it. And so we don't want to be mixing aftermarket coolant with this coolant because there could be a chance of um, non-compatibility. So... To safeguard against that, uh, it's not much more expensive to get this. So we're just gonna go ahead and stick with the genuine Mazda uh, coolant so that this way when we add it back in, we don't have any of the issues that could arise from mixing two different types of coolants. We have filled both the reservoir bottle and the radiator with fresh new coolant. The next thing that needs to be done is the cooling system needs to be burped. In other words, we need to be able to remove all of the air pockets that are in the system so that the coolant can flow properly. According to the instructions that Mazda has given for burping the cooling system, they want you to start the car and let it idle till it reaches its operating temperature. And the way you will know this is the blue light temperature light will disappear from your dash. Once the engine has warmed up, they want you to do two things. One, increase the RPM and hold it at 2500 RPMs 
for five minutes, and then they want you to bump the RPM to 3000 RPM for five seconds, and then they want you to let it idle. Once you've done this, they want you to repeat this process a couple of times. When this process of burping is done, they want you to stop the car and let the engine cool down, and then they want you to check the coolant level in the water reservoir bottle. If everything, if the coolant is at the right level, then you're done burping the system. However, if the coolant level dropped below the low point, then what you need to do is, is add coolant into the reservoir, start the vehicle, and repeat this process again. I will type out these instructions in the comments below so that you have that for your reference. Now that the car has had a chance to cool down after our burping, our initial burping session, uh, we're checking the fluid level. The fluid level in the in the bottle is higher than low, which is perfectly fine. We don't have any other leaks, so this car, the, the, the cooling system has been burped and we are good to go and close up everything. Thank you for watching the video. I hope that this has been helpful to show how this can be done. Please ask your questions down below. I'll do my best to answer them in a timely fashion. And please help me out by liking, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. Thank you.